We're going to have another testimony today, but before we do that, what I want to do is I want to, I just want to ask you, I'm going to come and ask you some questions right now, but how many of you, you have a product, I know this has happened to me, there's something that, that you get, you buy it, somebody gives it to you as a gift and you're like, I love this thing so much and you just keep talking about it, in fact, you love it so much you almost feel like you could become a spokesperson for that product. Has anybody ever had a thing like, you're all going to say no, because I'm going to, I've never had that happen, because I don't want you to come to me right now, yeah. Has, has anybody, though, have you ever had that? If everybody raised their hand, then I just get to pick one, you know. What is something that, that you bought, <laughs> you, all, you all are like frozen right now, like I don't even, I don't want this microphone, I want to have nothing to do with this. I want to make a point, I want to make a point. Be honest. Have you ever purchased something? Somebody gave you something, you have it, and you love that thing so much that you tell me you got to get one of these. Have you ever said that? You, you have. I have. I have. Anybody have an AeroPress coffee thing? Like a coffee maker deal? There's probably a couple of you do. When we first got that thing, I'm telling you, I could have been the spokesperson for that bugger because I, I wanted, I mean, this is so easy to make a cup of coffee with this thing, boom, done, you're not, you're not percolating anything, it was just, it's sweet. I, we've been using it for years, and I, now I could become the spokesperson for it. It's, it's called AeroPress, and you can get one on Amazon. Uh, they're very cool, they make great gifts, and they've even, uh, they've even upgraded it a little bit, so in case you're interested. All right, how's that? I just gave you a testimony about something. All right? Amen. Let me ask you another question. Is there a product that you have used that you've hated so much that you want to tell everybody don't ever use this thing? Raise your hand. <laughs> you guys are impossible today. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so funny. Do you get my point? Amen. You get it? Do you have a football team that you love? Do you have a baseball team you love? A hockey team you love? And I see people, I mean, we testify all the time about things, about circumstances. We talk about our kids. We testify about, think about all of the things we testify about in our lives easily. And it doesn't matter who we're talking about in front of. But as soon as it comes to Jesus, Something happens. Isn't that true? Yeah. I have a goal. I have an aim to change that. I want to change that. I want it so that when we come to think about Jesus and want to talk about Jesus, that man, this is the thing. I, I, I don't want to talk about the AeroPress anymore. That's stupid compared to this. Amen. Yeah. I want to talk about Jesus. Yeah. I want you as a believer in Jesus to become so comfortable talking about Jesus that your testimony is just, it's just going to come flowing out of you. But we have to get over some hurdles first, right? We got to get past some, some hard things, whatever it's, it's in our head, it's in our heart, whatever it is. But I want to get us to move past this because as a pastor of this church, I want for every single person who comes to Revive, who's part of Revive, who hears my voice speaking up here every week. I want every single person to know their testimony. It's powerful, you guys. It's powerful. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But first, because you were very resistant, I'm not going to come out there and get... To... I'm kidding. I want to invite somebody up here. I know she's, uh, she's scared a little bit to come up, as a lot of people are. But that's, I, I want to say this, that's, that's okay and it's normal and we just are. Because standing and, and talking in front of 100 plus people is not easy for anybody, right? And so I want you to just welcome warmly Diana Erickson to come on up here. Diana is going to come and share her testimony. But what was, what's really cool about Diana coming to share her testimony is she came to me and said, I'm ready to do this but she's scared but I love that you're doing this afraid and, and this is so good so put your attention on Diana let's hear what she's got good morning, to say everybody I'm not a public speaker and I'm an ugly crier so <laughs> be prepared for that Danielle get some tissues okay okay 
Growing up, I always went to Wednesday night church, and almost every Sunday I would attend church camps in the summer. I remember seeing a play with my grandma and grandpa called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Anybody else see that? Yeah, okay. (laughs) I think that was at Maranatha, the old Maranatha. Um, um, Not only was that play very impactful at my young age, it was also the first time I got a Bible. Fast forward to me being in my 20s, I'm newly married, attending a local church almost every Sunday. Then one day when I was at work, something was happening to me. I knew something wasn't right, and, I, and I, I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I called my whole family and let them know that my coworker was bringing me to the emergency room. My family knows I do not like going to the doctor, so they knew it had to be serious. Surrounded by my whole family, at 24 years old, the doctor told me I have MS. Hearing my sister and my mom's reactions, I was then scared. I didn't know what MS was. I asked the doctor, am I dying? And he smiled and said, well, no, not today. I said, can I still have kids? And he said, yes. Trying to stay positive with my new diagnosis, I was later admitted into the ICU because I couldn't see. I started to get double vision and completely lost my vision. Sorry. (laughs) Um, So, I'm so, so sorry. I have something. Thank you. <laughs> um, after being admitted in the ICU because I lost my vision, I'm mean, not really proud to say this, but I was really angry. I said, why me? Why now? I'm only 24. I remember not being able to walk or even write my own name. My family came to see me when I was getting a steroid infusion to get my vision back. And one thing that really stood out to me is that my aunt came to see me and gave me my grandma's Bible, who died earlier that year. Flash forward three years, I had a beautiful daughter named Elsie, who you might see around here wearing princess dresses and running around in the halls. After Elsie was getting a little bit older, we decided to add to our family. But unfortunately, after multiple miscarriages, I felt defeated. I hid a lot behind my smile, trying to act like I was okay. Instead of turning to my faith, I turned to drinking, a lot of drinking, until the drinking didn't make me feel better. Since the drinking wasn't helping, I thought there was only thing one left to do to end my pain, and that was to take my own life. I thought that if I just ended it all, that it would all go away. And then one night when I was up late at night drinking, I thought, tonight's going to be the night. But something stopped me that night. And the next night, I now know what, I now know what stopped me. It was God trying to reach out for me and bring me back to him. After getting the help I needed from family and friends, I was feeling like me again. But something was missing. Last November, I had another miscarriage, and I knew in that moment I couldn't go back to drinking in the depression again. I knew I wanted to go back to church and not only go back to church, but have a real relationship with God. I texted my beautiful sister, Danielle, and said, would you want to go to church with me? She replied back, how did you know I wanted to start going back to church? God, God was guiding us together, and he brought us to Revive. On our first time here, we both cried during worship, and we filled out the newcomer card, where we both filled out that we wanted to be baptized, and in March, it happened. We even played rock, paper, scissors to see who got to go for first, and she won. <laughs> Leading up to that moment, before I was about to be baptized, I thought, does God still love me? Will he forgive me? Was I gone too long? That moment I came up from the water, I felt his love and grace, and I was home, and I was saved. I now know that he never left me, not once. I turned away from him for too long, but this time I was running to him. God has blessed my life in so many ways. I've made new friends and found a new family here at church. I've been reading my Bible in a year. Even some days I fall behind, I still pick it up. Even at three in the morning when I fell asleep, I said I had to pick it up and read it. I've even never been the best at praying. I get distracted really easily, but I make sure I have enough time where I can pray and worship the Lord alone. I also love praying with my daughter every night. 
She also knows when mommy's praying out loud in the car, she joins when I see an ambulance passing by. We pray for anybody who's in the ambulance and whose loved ones or families that are involved and that everyone's going to be okay and also for the first responders. I want to... I, would, I want to read something my sister sent me while I was writing this testimony. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. The pain that you have been feeling can't compare to the joy that's coming. And after praying and just trusting that God has a plan for me, I can finally say he's answered my prayers and I'm being blessed with a baby this June. And I'm so forever grateful for his love and mercy. That's it. Uh, that's so good. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here, here, hold on, hold on. So, since, since you've come back to church, mm-hmm. and since you've been, you've been in your Bible, you've been praying, there are other things in your life, this, even little things that you've noticed, these things have changed in you, daily things. More of like, I won't listen to some music that I'm like, that's not appropriate, and I listen to more Christian radio on the way in or I won't listen to any music yeah. certain movies and I kind of try not to watch a lot of the social media things I just want to get into my books and kind of steer yeah. away from that so you're taking care of your heart more. Yes. you're paying attention yes. to those things yes oh that's so good yeah would you all say just just two things to Diana would you say you're home, you're home. and you're safe. you're safe amen thank you that's so good that's good yeah. Isn't it cool to hear testimonies? Yeah. It's so good. And you know what? I, I, I really, um, I'm really proud when you share your testimony and you do it afraid. And you say you're afraid because there are, there are more of us who are going to be sharing testimonies and just to know that it's okay to have a little nervousness in doing that. And the more you do it, the, the better it gets, the easier it gets. Testimony is so important in our journey with Jesus. Uh, and I, I just, I, I want to let you know that that's why we're dedicating these weeks. And then we'll do it again in, a, in several months. We're, gonna, we're always going to bring about testimony because I think it's incredibly important to your Christian journey to your faith, your development, but the people around you get impacted by your testimony. You never know when God is going to intersect you with someone that will share, it it could be a a 60 second testimony, you could share a two minute, five minute, ten minute, or maybe this is a long sit down and you're you're going to go in deep and you're going to share your testimony for 20 or 30 minutes with somebody because they need to hear it. But you won't be able to do that unless you, you have done it with yourself, unless you have recounted this to yourself and learned your testimony for yourself. So my hope is that not, not only are you um, encouraged and inspired by someone else's testimony, but that you act on your own. And I think it's, it's incredibly important. And I can't stress enough, please don't just listen to these messages. Please don't just, just take the encouragement and say, that's nice. I really want you to honestly dig in, connect yourself to your testimony. Because it is the power of God in a transformed life. Amen? Amen. Your testimony, I'm going to say this again, is a witness of or to the power of God on display in your life. That's what your testimony is. And so, do you love Him? Do we honor Him? Do we worship Him? Yep. Then let's talk about Him. Let's be very free in talking about Him. And the more comfortable you are with it, and the more acquainted you are with your testimony, the easier it's going to be. I'm just going to keep saying this, maybe in different ways. But are you convinced that Jesus has done a good work in you? Are you convinced that Jesus has done a good work in you? Answer that question. Amen. Yeah. So testify. He can do a good work in the life of the person who you're talking to as well. And that's the hope. That's the hope that we share our testimony so that we can see the effect of that in someone else. How many of you can say, 
in your time. And I know, you know, looking out here, there are many of you who you've had a long walk with the Lord. And even if it's not been a long walk with the Lord, maybe it's just been recent. But how many of you can say, again, by a show of hands, and I believe this is just unashamed, you can say that you were blind, but now you see. And look around. Look around at those who, how many people raise their hand when we say that. I was blind, but now I see. And the reason why I like to have a show of hands sometimes is so that you can look around and you realize, I'm not alone. Because if there's one thing that the devil wants to do to us is to say, you're all alone. You're in this by yourself. And then we think, well, I'm the only one this has ever happened to. I'm never going to say anything about this to anybody. But the reality is, you're not alone. There are all kinds of people around you who can say, I was blind, but now I see. I want to read a a pretty long passage. This is from John chapter 9. And in John chapter 9 is the story of the blind man. And I want to read this through because this really, it ends with a very simple testimony. So if you can follow along, and again on the app, if you look at the app, all of this is in there under the Grow tab. Go under today's scripture and this should be there. John chapter 9, verse 1 through 25. It says, As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, they asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because that was the thought of the day, that if there was something wrong with you, there must have been sin somehow involved. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened... And I want you, if you got your Bible out, circle so that. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I'm the light of the world. So after saying this, Jesus spit on the ground. He made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Every single time I read this, I think about the creation story. What were we made of? Man was made from dust, right? So we were made from the dirt, from the dust of the ground, and that, and that as the waters came into being. I mean, that this, I always think of creation when I think of this. And Jesus putting Jesus, God spit on the ground, that the dust that He already made, and he was doing a creating work here, doing a creation work here. And I just think this is, this is more powerful. A lot of times we just, just read over, it's just like, bing, just glancing off of this thing, and then we're moving on to something else. But I slow down. So Jesus said, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man? who used to sit and beg, and some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I'm the man. So how then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, well, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. Can you imagine having to tell that testimony? He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. You see how simple? He just, it's just that simple. Well, where is this man? They asked him. I don't know. I couldn't see. He walked away. I don't know which direction he went. (laughs) They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. 
So I just want to stop there. There's, there's time that happens between verse 18 and verse 19. It says, so they, they sent for the man's parents. And we just read the next verse and they just say, is it your son? As if they time traveled there and got their lickety split. You know what I'm saying? But I, I just look at this and I think, okay, there's time between verse 18 and verse 19. It could have been hours, actually. Because they had to go out somewhere into the city. They had to find mom and dad. They had to make their way. Well, they had to convince mom and dad. Yeah, you're, just so you know, your son's standing in front of the Sanhedrin right now. What? There's a whole dialogue and drama that could be going on just with that to get them there. And so I just want you to appreciate the time between verse 18 and 19. And so now they're all standing there and, and they say, they question, is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now he can see? Well, we know this, he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. But listen to this. Verse 22 explains this. It says his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said he is of age, ask him. And I want to stop right there too and just point out the fact that these people not only lived in the oppressive, uh, under the oppressive heavy hand of the Romans, but there was some religious oppression here too. There was some fear here too. And in something that we just said to Diana, you're home and you're safe, those are important words because not everybody feels home and safe even in a place like this. Does that make sense? And so we, you know, we need to be careful in the church that we aren't putting a heavy hand on people and that we aren't imposing all kinds of rules on them and that they have this kind of fear. If they were to say anything about Jesus the Messiah and acknowledge him, they would be not just put out of the synagogue. That was just a way of saying they would basically be excommunicated. They would no longer be part of that Jewish family, the, 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 the believing family there. Does that make sense? So that's an incredible amount of fear being put on mom and dad right there. So what did they do? They didn't answer the question. They passed that off on their son, protecting themselves and their status in the synagogue. Make sense? A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's the testimony. And so I ask you again, were you blind, but now you see? I was. I was blind, and now I see. What do you know for sure? I had a guy, when I was about 19 years old, my best friend was a 39-year-old black man in Minneapolis. I was working at the produce warehouse, and, and we, we, just, we had a great relationship. There's a lot to this story, but I wanted to say this one piece of that. And I've shared this before from time to time over the years, but there was one day, his name is Dave, and I came in, and he was in the, in the back hall, and he was doing a job back there. He was a, a tomato sorter. And what he did is he sorted the ripe tomatoes from the green tomatoes and, and the different stages of green tomatoes from the different stages of ripe tomatoes. And then that's what all went out to the restaurant. So I, would, I did that job for a while. I touched a million tomatoes and, and I never want to do that again. <laughs> Every once in a while you stick your hand into this uh, sneaky rotten tomato that, that's underneath there. And it, it's disgusting. And I just... I appreciate a real clean tomato, I'm just going to tell you that. But one day Dave was back there, and I went and visited him. And he said that, he asked me this question, he just said, what do you know for sure? And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, I just, so I start throwing out these 
whatever odd answers to this thing. And he just kept asking me. And I'm like, he was so persistent. He's like, well, what do you know for sure? And I'm like, what? Uh, Jesus loves me? And I said it like that. And he's like, yeah. And I never forgot that. What do you know for sure? And I'm thinking, yeah, he does. I also knew for sure I didn't always love him back. But I knew he loved me. And that one single question never left me. What if you were to ask that to somebody? What do you know for sure? Well, let me ask you, what do you know for sure? What are you absolutely certain about? Because those things, they go in your testimony. Do you know for sure Jesus loves you? Do you know for sure, for certain that He died for your sin, that you can have eternal life? If you know those things for sure, they're absolute. Do you know for sure that you were blind, but now you see? I know that for sure. I was blind, but now I see. But if there's even one thing that you know, I just want to encourage you to testify. But have you ever written your story? And this is something I say a lot in messages like this because I think it's incredibly important. And it might be that one of the times that I say it, somebody will go, fine, <laughs> I will do this then. I, I will start writing down my testimony, outlining, putting in key words, whatever it is that you have to do. But I believe you need to get a computer or a pen and paper in front of you and you need to start articulating what is your testimony. Was there a time in your life you were blind and now you can see? You should write that down and be more specific. What was that time like for you? But write your story down. Speak it out loud. Then speak it to somebody else. Share it with somebody. Share it in an email. Share it in a text. Do you have your journal? Do you have it right now? Maybe the notes on your phone is where you do a lot. I do a lot of writing there myself now. But you could put, start here, I was blind, but now I see. Thank you, Jesus. But one of the things that I want to encourage is that we shift from apprehension in sharing our testimonies to an eagerness to share our testimonies. Because if we're going to be honest, I really think that most of us, most people, if you were to ask them, hey, how would you like to share your testimony? I don't know. I am not, I can't do this. We know, I know, that most of you are not public speakers. I get it. This is not what you want to do. Right, Diana? I mean, do you know that right in that little row right there, I mean, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six people in a row who've all shared, seven, who've shared eight, nine, maybe ten. Look at that. This is the testimony spot right over here, you guys. If you want to start sharing your testimony, sit over here. <laughs> now, you guys are going to, there's going to be a big hole around you next week. Everybody is going to be sitting over here. We might have to cross from apprehension to eagerness through prayer and to say, God, all of this talk about testimony, I'm struggling with sharing mine. I'm going to need your help. Will you help me? And you know what he's going to say? I've been waiting for you to ask for that because I want to help you. I want to help you share your testimony. But it's probably not something that's going to happen overnight. It might, but it's going to come with prayer and with practice and we have to do this. But I've got four or five things that I just want to share with you. Okay, the first one is the value of your testimony should never be underestimated or determined by you. Amen. The value of your testimony should never be underestimated or determined by you. Let God make that determination for you. Amen? Because if you put a value on your testimony and you make that determination for yourself, there's a likelihood you'll never share it because you'll never feel worthy of sharing it. And then when he intersects you with the, pers the, the perfect person that needs to hear your testimony, you'll probably be hesitant to do that, to share it. So don't, the, the, the value of your testimony should never be underestimated or determined by you. Let God do that. God knows your story. He knows who would benefit from hearing it. Amen? True? 
He knows you. He knows your story. In fact, when you pray and you get Holy Spirit to help you, He's going to remind you, you know, I'd really love if you put this thing in your story. Remember when this happened? I would love for you to remember that because I'm not going to tell you this, but I've got somebody coming up on the timeline here. I really want you to share that with them. You guys, your testimony is alive. It's alive. And it's real. And it's tangible. And it's useful. And it's powerful. But when you give God access to your testimony, you are permitting Him to intersect your life with someone else's life for His glory. Does God, so here's the question, does God have access to your testimony? Give Him access to your testimony. Can He use it when and how He pleases? And again, this fear, I'm not a public speaker. Neither was the blind man. How many of you just are not public speakers? Let's just see. Just out of curiosity. Oh, there again. Almost all of you. A whole bunch of you. All right. Do you see what I'm saying? Hardly anybody is. So when you're standing up here and you're not a public speaker, you've got a whole bunch of people who are not a bunch of public speakers going, man, she's doing a good job. Right? Good job. Number two. Lack of eloquence on my part will never diminish the power of God on His. Lack of eloquence on my part will never diminish the power of God on His part. Do you believe that? Yes. You do not have to be polished and refined and eloquent and all of these things. That is another reason why a lot of people choose not to pray in public. It's because, ah, oh, I just, it doesn't flow out of me. Who cares? Is it true? Is it honest? Are you believing what you're saying? Then, then it's good. It's fine. Pray, you guys. Man, if we waited for the whole world to be eloquent, we'd be waiting for a really long time. Right? How many times have we said this? My words aren't very good. I don't know what to say. I can't talk in front of people. Not even in front of one person. Well, here's the deal. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. Give God glory and open your mouth. But here's what I want, I want to say this. Let's commit now to not let a spirit of intimidation of any kind have its way with us. Okay? I'm going to say that again that we commit to not let a spirit of intimidation of any kind have its way with us, that we would reject, that we would not enter in, that we would not do the bold thing, that we would not share our testimony, that we would not pray, I'm intimidated, I'm full of fear. Can we just quench that right now? Quench that fear in Jesus' name? Amen. Church, let's be bold. Church, let's be strong. Let's get out there. The blind man if you realize this, stood before Israel's most powerful men. The ones who could say, you're in the synagogue or you're out. But listen to this. His testimony was, was these three things that, that, I, that I find in it. It was simple. It was honest. And it was powerful. Why? Because it was true. Because it was attached to Jesus. So simple, honest, powerful. That's what his testimony was. I was blind, but now I see. Boom! That's like dropping a big bomb right there, isn't it? I was blind, but now I see. That's your testimony. Share it with somebody. Do you, are you blind? Do you want to see too? One thing I know, for sure, Jesus loves me. I was blind, but now I see. And we won't know how people, how our family, how our friends, or anyone will respond uh, that that they, they might be offended by this, you know. So, so we, we don't know. Give that to God. Let Him worry about the offense on the other side. You just share your testimony. Number three, your testimony of Jesus could cost you something. Your testimony of Jesus could cost you something. And like I mentioned, the blind man risked being put out of the synagogue, excommunication. 
And I've, I've asked this question before, and many of you have raised your hands, but in your walk and sharing your testimony and living out your faith, I know that a number of you, you've lost friends. Some of you, your families even distance themselves from you because they just don't want to be with the weirdo Jesus freak. True? I'll tell you what, it's better to be a weirdo Jesus freak. Amen. By far. But when we realize what Jesus has done for us, it really doesn't matter anymore what anybody else thinks. Amen? It doesn't matter. There is no longer any shame in sharing the truth about Jesus. And I love that. Man, how many of you, you have no problem, you're at the grocery store, you're at a restaurant, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, eventually Jesus is going to be part of the conversation. Todd, you could raise your hand right now. <laughs> but it's true. You want to hang around somebody who doesn't have any problem, hang around Todd. Let me ask you this, just so that we know who to hang around. How many of you, that's true for you? You don't have any problem talking about Jesus, no matter, raise your hand high, come on. These are the people you guys want to hang out with. There you go, right there. Did you see that? Huh, that's pretty funny. Most of those people were on this side. <laughs> there was a few over here. We're going to have a tug of war. I love it. I love you. And I love that, that if you want to have an eagerness to share the gospel, start with your testimony. But in Luke chapter 9, 26, it says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of them when He comes in His glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I do not want the Lord to be ashamed of me. I want to easily have His name on my lips. Do you believe Jesus is who He says He is? Yes. Let me ask again. And Keith paved the way there. Do you believe that Jesus is who He says He is? Yes. Hallelujah. Testify. You guys, if you go back to the Discern series a couple of months ago in, in coming up here, it was eight, eight messages. And one of the things that I talked about a lot was the foundation is absolute. Jesus is absolute. The truth is absolute. You don't have to share your testimony going, I'm not sure if this is true or not. Are you, I'm standing on shaky ground here. You're not, in fact, standing on shaky ground. You know that what you believe is absolute, so you can share it with confidence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know that the Word of God is solid. You know that the Word of God is true. You know that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You know that He was persecuted, beaten, and, and put on a cross, bloody, for your sin. Amen? You know that. Is that absolute to you? I hope it is. If it's absolute to you, you have a love for Him to talk about that. Let's, let, let's make that no problem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the person you're talking to, he did the same for. Amen. John chapter 9, verse 35 through 38, kind of comes back into the story. Jesus had heard that they had thrown the blind man, that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, when Jesus found the blind man, he said, he came up to him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And I just think, think about the power of this. You have now seen Him. In fact, He's the one speaking with you. Those powerful words. Jesus found the blind man. He went and found the man who can now see. And He gave him the question of faith right there. Do you believe? You show me who He is. You tell me who he is, and I will believe. And Jesus said, it's me. He's standing here, right here. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And I want to point out what that means. He didn't sing his favorite three songs to him. He didn't pull out his beats and put them on Jesus' ear. Man, this is what I would be singing right here. He didn't, he didn't do that. Do you know what it means right there? That he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. That word is proskuneo in the Greek. 
And here's what it means. It means to fall on your knees and to kiss the ground of the one who's standing in front of you. That is what the blind man did. He didn't just go, here's a thousand hallelujahs for you. Now, I'm not making fun of that song because I love that song. But what I'm saying, that's not what, what, what the blind man did. The blind man did something incredibly intimate, quiet, personal, but also something that anybody around could see. Because when it comes to the last day, do you know what you will be given a choice to do? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Right? And we have an opportunity to do that bowing by choice right now because there's going to come a day, I don't believe that day will be a choice. That day is just going to be everybody bow. But this proscuneo right here, this is your worship. This is your opportunity to get before the King of Kings and to put your face to the ground. And there's no music playing. There might be music playing, but that part doesn't matter. What matters is your heart bowing. Are you bowing? That's worship. And that's what the blind man did. To fall on your face, to fall on your knees, no matter who's watching. And I want to tell you this too about worship. Worship is testimony. Worship is testimony. The fourth thing, that your testimony is not all about you. Like worship, your testimony points to Jesus. Amen. Your testimony is not all about you. and Like worship, your testimony points to Jesus. Do you know why there's no competition in testimony? The reason why there's no competition in testimony is because it's always about the same thing. Amen. It all points, no matter where it's coming from, it all points to the same thing. That's why there's no competition in testimony. Because when we think it's about me, then we start to judge. Then we start to have testimony envy. I wish I had a testimony like yours. I guarantee you, no, you don't. Does that make sense? Why would you want to say that you go through the same kind of hell and tribulation that somebody else did so that you can have a great testimony? Because don't forget, it's a great testimony, but that was still hell and tribulation that somebody had to go through to get there and praise God that they got where they are. But it is a powerful and profound testimony for the one who found the light, stayed on the light, got on the path, followed the Lord like that and didn't have to go through all of that either. That is equally powerful. There's no competition in testimony. Does that make sense? Because it's not about us. It's about Him. Because He's the one who took the punishment. He's the one who bore the cross. He's the one who died. He's the one who defeated death. He's the one who rose from the dead. And He's the one who saves only Him. That's why our testimonies all point to the right direction, to the right place. Because He's the one who gets the glory of your testimony. And I want to end with this. You sharing your testimony helps you remember and there's something very profound about this. I know that when I share my testimony, it reminds me of what God has done in my life. How about for you? When you get to share your testimony and aspects of your testimony, like there are things that you've forgotten about that, that the Lord prompts and has you share, it might not just be for the person who's listening because He knows how to do two things at once. Anybody else know that? He knows how to get you to share your testimony for the benefit of that person and for your benefit as well. So that you are listening again. So let's be careful not to despise sharing our testimony. Sometimes it is a sacrifice because sacrifice was part of it. We testify to the unbeliever for salvation. We testify to the believer for encouragement. And as we testify, we're reminded of the goodness of God over and over again. So the more we can share our testimony, the better. Like many of you, there have been times that I've been far from God. There have been times that I've, I've had distance. It feels like miles. It, it feels like space between us. And He will bring somebody and set them down in front of me and then prompt me somehow to share a word, to share a testimony, and it brings me right back to where I needed to be. He's so good at that. 
He's so faithful with that. God's reminded me of His love. He's reminded me of the, the journey, the steps that we've taken together, the things that we have done together. And I just love to be able to share that with others. But remembering is important. Sharing our testimony helps us to remember. Remembering and giving Him glory. That's what we need to do. So just as we close here this morning, not only do I want to challenge you to write down and share your testimony, but I want to I want, to, um, I want to be more specific about something. I want to challenge you to share it with two people. Believers and unbelievers. Okay? Because, remember, we share with believers for encouragement. We share with unbelievers for salvation. And so I want to encourage you, challenge you, and maybe this is just something you're going to be praying about, but ask God to help you to conquer the fears in doing this. Amen. Why don't you stand this morning? As a church, and maybe you can even say this for yourself, as a church, I don't want to be benign in this neighborhood, in this city, wherever we can reach, wherever we can touch. I don't want to be benign. I don't want to have a zero effect I want us to have a profound effect. And I've even said that for myself, for my own life. I don't want to be in relationship with people where I have zero effect. I want to have effect. But it's not me, it's Jesus in me. See, I used to think it was me. And now I realize it's Jesus in me. I don't want to have zero effect, amen? Would you say that as, as well, just for yourself? I don't want to have zero effect. Heavenly Father, we just ask you, Lord, as we consider our testimonies, each one, Lord, as we consider the, the story, the journey, the time of walking together, Lord, that you would help bring to recollection, that you would give us inspiration, that you would give us direction, that we would see something important about our testimony, each one of us. So God, we give our testimony back to you that you can do with it whatever you want to. In Jesus' name, amen.